Hey everybody, in this video I've got an exciting video for you because I think that this video is probably more special than some of the other ones because I think it's really going to be a eye-opener for a lot of you that either has been a source of confusion or a source of just I don't even know how to explain what it is because I don't even know what it is, right? And so you've tried to look it up, maybe you gave up, maybe you've run across it, maybe you figured it out. Nonetheless, um, it's, it's all about this at symbol, okay? So the title of the video as well as what's going on is what the, and in a bracket, the at symbol is this. I guess you could fill in what the blank is, <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that unless you know what this is in the Power Platform, you're going to have a near impossible time even searching for it to get any information and answers. So let's start with the documentation. So the documentation, I'm going to click the Alt button and come down here where it says documentation. I'm going to click it and it takes us to this area. Now I've been working through this formula reference for you guys in this series and I came down to as and I clicked on it and that's where I came. And I'm like, okay, well this is part of something much bigger and it's like, oh, operators and identifier and power apps. It's like, yeah, I've seen all of these. I think this would be a great video. It's not a function, but I did in the last video or maybe the video before that, I described when we were using and, or, or not, how you could use operators in place of the functions that are there, okay? So I ran across this one operator, which is this at symbol, and I remembered the pain, oh, the pain that I went through understanding what this is, and that was my problem. I didn't know first it was an operator, and B, even if I did know it was an operator, I guess if I did know it was an operator, then I could at least go to the documentation here and find it, uh, and then try to get a, a little bit more information. But Microsoft refers to this symbol as a disambiguous operator, okay? And so if you, if you didn't know to search Google for that, you're gonna have a really hard time finding videos. You're gonna have a really hard, you probably even had a hard time finding this video unless you just stumbled across it in uh, the series. But nonetheless, we are going to demystify this. So not only am I gonna show you about what it is and what it means and how it's used, I'm gonna show you a really cool trick that will help you with validating your data uh, using this type of technique as well as this operator, which is more than how the documentation even describes it. And then I'm going to show you an error in the documentation for Microsoft that that makes it even better. So before we begin, let's click on this, which will take us to here. And while this is all well and good, which I'll explain, uh, let's click over into record scopes because down here under disambiguation, I want to focus because I've got some code that I'm going to use here in today's example. All right, so let's look at this magical code. Actually, before we get started with the magical code, I want to take a, uh, a text box and I want to put it over here and I want to use it to start showing information. So let's do multiple lines and let's align this to the top, which is somewhere around here. Oh, it already did. Anyway, I was thinking of the label. Okay, so let's click into this and let's start. Okay, so the magical at symbol, what does this mean? So the syntax can be multiple ways. The first one is, let's just talk about a table, right? So we've got a table, T-A-B-E-L, T-A-B-L-E, I always get mixed up, T-A-B-L-E. Yeah. All right. Table at, nope, block bracket at. That's probably the best way to depict it. And let's do another variation of it and we'll just call it at. Okay. So these are the two ways that you're going to use it. Okay. You're going to see it used like this, and all this does. So let's talk about ambiguous. What is something that's ambiguous? Something ambiguous is like this. I've got a bruise on my arm. It looks like I've got a bite. And you ask me, hey, you've been bit by something. That looks pretty nasty on your arm. What, what happened? 
And so if I answer you like this, I said, yeah, I was out in the backyard. I was mowing the lawn and this thing bit me. And then you probably say, this thing, you don't know what bit you? And I say, no, I know what bit me. And then you're going to get even more confused. Like, okay, if you know what bit you, then why did you just generically say this thing bit you, right? And there's this whole argument. And that's the problem, right? You don't know. And I gave you something very generic and ambiguous. Now, if I said to you, yeah, I was out back mowing the lawn and this snake bit me. Okay, cool. Now we know what this is. And so you might say, well, how does this relate to Power Apps? Well, you know, there's a lot of things in Power Apps that use the word name, okay? Think about a table for, I don't know, contact. It could have just name. Ideally, it would have first name and last name and then full name, right? But maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just has a really crappy design. Maybe it just says name, right? So we've got this table. Let's just call this contact.name, right? So we're talking about a contact entity and then we're talking about you know, a, a, a table like this. So we could do it even more structured like, like this. And then we'll do at name. So what this means, uh, good Lord, David, come on. So what this means is, hey, for the contact table, I have a column called name. Now, what if I also had a variable called name, right? So then this would be a problem because then I would just have this. And this is very different syntax, right? So we've got set name. So that's the code. This is setting a global variable. And so that's this. But if I also had David Soden in a table, you know, and if you know about Power Apps, you know that brackets are tables. And I would just do uh, name. Well, this is not a good way to do it. Let's just do it with a record. Yeah, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. Come here. Come here, cursor. Why is it not going in? There it is. Okay, so when we do name, colon, and then we got, okay. So here I've got a table without a name, but I've got a column with the name name. And let's just say this was a table. I mean, I guess we could use the table function, right? And then add a record to it like that, right? But the, the table doesn't have a name, right? And so you can give it a name and we'll get to table functions later. But the point is you got a table named contact and a column named name. And then this is a variable name name. And so this is the disambiguous piece of it. What we're trying to do is to make clear which name we're referring to. It's like saying thing as opposed to snake, right? It's completely, completely different. All right, so with that history, now you understand why you will use this or why you've seen this in IntelliSense. And now when you see it in the future, you'll know that if you see something in front of the bracket, that's a table name. If you see a table name missing, then you know it's simply just referring to a global variable. All right, now with that, let's look at the setup here. I've got a couple of things and I made it ambiguous. I have a collection and that collection table, virtual in-memory table, and you can see it's a table because down here you can see data type is table. I called the table X, but inside of this, I just provided some values of one and two, numerical values. But notice there's no column name. And so what happens when you do this in Power Apps and you create a table without any column names, especially a single table? That table's name is all, or the column for that is always referred to as value. Well, that's a problem because down here, I'm setting a global variable also called value. So now you can see where this ambiguous comes. So a disambiguous operator is going to say which of these values are you talking about? And to make matters worse, I got a third instance where I have another table called table Y, and inside of it I'm giving it two strings of A and B. And so now I have three 
things that are value. I have a single table with no header with value being referred to by Power Apps as the column name. I've got the same thing happening here for table Y and a third problem where I've got a value being explicitly set as a global value. Okay, so that being said, let's jump over here back into the documentation. Let me show you the error because if you go to the error, I mean, if you go to the documentation and you read this, you can be like, what the heck is going on? So I want you to take note right here, okay? It's talking about the, the table that I talked about earlier, but here's the key. To access global values, now don't confuse this in the documentation with the example that I just gave you with values being there. There's too many usage of the word value. Ah, great implementation, right? This is how it's ambiguous because there's too many things that are called value and you're like, David, which value are you talking about? You're killing me. So it's really, in context just to the documentation. So to access global values such as data sources, collections, and this is where in my opinion they screwed up. They said context variables. It should be global variables, global values, not context variables. If you're not familiar with a context variable, you do context variables by simply using the function called update context which we won't get into and then inside of there I could set it like this value and I would just maybe put my name right and so now this is a context variable so I'll leave this here as well so that we can see this work so a couple things I'm gonna go ahead and click setup and then we'll look at the code here but I want to insert another label right and I'm gonna make the label um, value see so the catch, the question is, why did Power Apps know to pick this, right? It, it was smart, and I did something pretty, pretty, um, well, there's really no way of, of doing it this way, because if I, if I did it the other way, which was going to be like this, I'm gonna get an error. And the reason I'm gonna get an error is because that value isn't recognized. And if I go ahead and choose capital value, V for value, so what's going on here? Uh-oh, you see this? I have got a exclamation mark. So this is proving that the Microsoft documentation is wrong. So the reason that at value is working for me is because it's grabbing global values. If I just use value, it becomes valid because it always is looking in scope to what the value is. Now let me go ahead and create a new screen. If that didn't make sense, maybe this will bring it into more context. I'm gonna change this again to value. See this? I didn't even use, I didn't use the brackets, but notice it's picking it up. There's no way for me to reference the context variable in the other screen because it simply doesn't exist in scope. So this value and the other value is referring to completely different things. I can't access the context variable in this screen. And the reason is context variables are set up in scope. And its scope of a context variable is only limited to the screen from which the context variable exists. Otherwise, global variables are available all throughout your app, okay? So hopefully that makes clear. Um, even though update context is a, another function that we'll cover in a separate video, probably be very quick, but I needed to provide this for you because this is such a confusing topic to work with that if I don't cover all the different aspects, I know you could potentially get really, really confused. So now you know about context variables and local variables. So let's just go ahead and remove this context as to not cause any more confusion for myself as well as for you guys. And I'm gonna reset that. Okay, so now you might be saying, okay, what's going on here? Let's look at this table and let's look at this gnarly little function here. So let's go to item. Normally you'd specify a data source, 
And so this data source, don't freak out because we haven't covered these formulas yet. There's only one line of code I want you to focus on, and that's this. In the middle, y bracket value and text x whatever. You can see for yourself. Basically, all I'm doing is concatenating. I'm concatenating the uh, value for the particular row that I'm on. That's what these four all are. It loops over tables, and I'm not going to talk about this in this video. I'm not going to talk about ungroup, and we're not going to talk about text. We haven't covers, covered these yet. But just know to concatenate, it's almost like if I wanted to concatenate my name, just to give you an idea, and this is going to give an error, so ignore that because it's not being put in the right place. If I were to try to concatenate David and space and Soden, it would simply just be David space Soden because I'm concatenating three different values. This literal string David, this literal string which is just a space, and this literal string which is my last name. Okay, so that's all we're doing here. That's all you really need to understand. But the key is, is this has to show you what we're talking about. Table Y and the column and the current record because it's in the context of for all. So, and this is table X. And this is referring to the global variable, which we know is exclamation mark. So when we're doing all of that, this is exactly why and how we're getting the output that you're seeing because we've concatenated that for each of the separate tables okay so hopefully you now understand the only thing I really wanted you to take away are the two different instances or usage of the at symbol either as a global variable and or as a table name and column name now let's go back to the documentation and show you because if you go back over here um, they refer to this value like this but this is going to try to get to a global variable as you saw the problem is up here, they said context variable. Con I need you to take this context in here and replace it with the word global. Then down here, they screw up again by mentioning this. Define a context variable and value with this formula. No, don't do that. Do not use update context. Use set and then use value as the, you know, the essentially the global variable name and then give it a value of exclamation. And then this code works just fine, okay? So they've got that wrong. So that now takes us to the end of this particular area. I have a bonus for you. The bonus is going to be, how do I use this at symbol for validation against a table? And so this is a little known trick and or secret. And so what you can do is if you have a Dataverse table, you know what, let's go out over here into where I have all of my videos. In video number four, I provided you with this Excel spreadsheet to use with that lesson. Go ahead and download this if you wanna follow along. And I'm gonna click raw because that will download the Excel file. And so now I'm going to come over here to where I have tables. And assuming you have this button, use this upload to Excel. It is the easiest experience to use. Otherwise, you can come over here to import and import data from Excel. And it's a little bit harder to use. Each of these buttons will take you to completely different experiences. So if you use the dropdown, you're going to get what they call data flow. And data flow has its own way of doing it, its own wizard. It's not as clean as the new experience. And as you can see, it's taking forever. And the reason it's taking forever is because it's a .NET app and it lives on the backside of the administrative component of this. And anyway, I don't wanna get into all that, but the bottom line is it, it takes forever to spin up. And so now it's asking, what do we wanna Im import data from? And so um, it's not exactly so easy to use. So we'll do import from Excel, it should have taken me into an import data wizard and allows me to pick Excel. I don't know why that didn't work. So it's still trying to traverse through all of these different tables. Come on. If anything, I believe it may even be going out to my OneDrive or going out somewhere. So yeah, so it's, it's pulling all of the, the tables. It's not even giving me 
I think they broke this experience, to be honest with you. I may have found a, a bug. Let's say, choose the entity that you want to import from. I don't want to import anything from an entity. I want to import data from Excel, and it's not working. You see me click on it twice. Anyway, so click on Upload an Excel File. This is the experience you should be seeing and using. So hopefully you have that item. Otherwise, you'll be taken into what's called data flow. Click Select from Device. Pick the file that you just downloaded and let it upload. Now, we may or may not have to make some changes to the data types of the columns that it gets imported, but it does see everything it looks like correctly. So we've got title, and let's change the name of the column, display name. We'll just call this table foo, and primary column title, yeah, that's fine. So we'll call this foo, and title is a string text. See the ABC box, ABC box, ABC box, ABC box, and then we got a telephone. That means these are the data types that it's seeing for the data that we're importing. And this is really good because this is what we want to do. So just rename the title to foo. If state, sometimes it can try to get tricky because there's a choice default that's already in Dataverse. And this import wizard may try to get smart and detect that it can use a choice column. If it is a choice, instead of it saying text with a box like this, it's going to have three lines with three dots, like a bulleted list. And all that means, that symbol means that it's depicted the item of data type of, as a choice. For this example, if you're trying to follow along, make sure that that doesn't happen, okay? It may even happen for city too. Just make sure everything is text and the phone number is okay as a data type of phone number. Click Create, and again, make sure you change the table name to Foo just because it's so ridiculous you'll know what it is and then you can go ahead and delete it when you're done with it so we're going to create this table again it has a thousand rows so it may take a little bit of time to populate and now everything is in here all right now we're going to consider this in a different perspective let's grab a button let's bring this button down here and on the button for the let's see here on select yep let's grab this Let's consider this collection, okay? Now, there's a method to my madness. Notice the table has title, address, city, state, zip, phone, all of that, right? And notice my collection. Now, these two have nothing to do with each other. Coincidentally, not really, but coincidentally, as of right now, we have title, address, city, phone, state, and zip, right? And if I go ahead and run this code, it's going to create a collection called Cole My Collection. I'm going to click over here to where we have variables, and you can see the collection. Right now, there's no rows, but it is detecting that there's a collection. So it puts a temporary placeholder in memory, and it's waiting for us to add values, of which I did. I click to refresh, and now you can see I have table one row. And if I go to view, I now have my data. And you're like, dude, I already knew this. What are you doing? I already knew the clear collect function, which by the way, we haven't covered yet, but this is how you would go ahead and use it in this example. And the magic to the sauce right now is going to be, let's add that new table that we just added or imported from the Excel. So I'm gonna come over here to add data and under tables, I'm gonna click refresh and I'm gonna look for that table called foo which it pluralized, so it's called foos. Anyway, so now I've got foos in here. Now let's, we got the button. We've got this data source added. Here's what we want to do. We want to bind this local in-memory collection to the Dataverse table behind the scenes. Now this could be a SQL table. This could be SharePoint. This trick works on any data source. All you need to do is make sure you add the data source first and then you can do this trick. So the first thing what we wanna do up here before this top curly brace, because this is the record, okay? And what we wanna do is we wanna do, uh, do, 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 we're gonna do foos, right? So we're gonna do foos, ah, okay? So that magical at, along with the data source, takes my record and binds this data to the data source. Now, nothing's changed. I'm gonna click the button, and if I go to my collection, here, let me collapse this up a little bit, and if I go to the collection, 
actually my collection and I come here but let's come over here my collection refresh view the table like nothing's changed right everything's good it's still a local in-memory table but what you don't realize is that it's schema bound my local record my in-memory record in this in-memory table to my data source on the back end and what do you mean by schema bind David well what I mean by that is that the data types are bound together so if I screw up and see how zip code is in a string what if I have just a numerical value right okay hey I'm getting an error well why am I getting an error it's because incompatible type the zip column in the data source you expect a text and you're using a number type see this is what's very helpful now if I remove the schema bind it's accepted because it doesn't know anything about that other table it's very independent it's operating independently but if you want to bind your local in-memory collection and schema bind it to a table you simply just do the table name at and you give the reference so what it'll try to do is match up these each of these rows it doesn't have to be exact right it could only be one but it's going to validate that the data type value matches why is this important because when you run patch statements you could run into all kinds of problems and errors so it could be considered a best practice and I'm gonna let you determine if that's a best practice that you want to incorporate in your strategy but you can schema bind in-memory collections of data to a back-end data source again I use Dataverse you could have used SQL Server anyway I've gone on quite long enough about all of this I hope all of this esoteric knowledge about disambiguous or the ambiguous operator helps you understand why this exists how to use it in power apps and to make your programming power fx experience that much richer that's it for this video we'll see you in the next one have a good one bye bye